months, I've gotten to know Arthur Garrick, the global chief marketing officer for Rocket Internet. When I first met Arthur, I was kind of like, well, another CMO meeting. And I've kind of got this down. You know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to talk in very high level terms about AppNexus. We're a platform, there's some technology, it's really good. Um, and we'll get into some high level conversation about agency rebates or about transparency or something. And when I got to the Rocket Internet offices in Berlin and we sat down, I think the very first thing he asked me was how he could pass in custom key value pairs and get them back out through streaming log level data. And I was like, I must have picked up the wrong business card. Are you sure you're the CMO? And this whole conversation was basically about things like we've been talking about today. How can a company like Rocket Internet take full advantage of the capabilities of a platform like AppNexus? And I was so amazed that one, he would go be a chief marketing officer, and two, that Rocket would make him the chief marketing officer, that I asked him to come here to speak. Because I think that through his eyes and words, you're going to understand the future of the chief marketing officer, and I think the future of digital marketing. So, Arthur, Catherine, our chief data scientist, welcome. Neither of those is Arthur or Catherine. This is Arthur and Catherine. Well, hello, Arthur, thank you so much for being here today with us. So Brian said a little bit about Rocket Internet, but we don't hear from you too much as a company. Uh, the press says that you are an investment company, a venture capital firm, and an incubator all at the same time. Can you explain what is Rocket Internet? Yes, of course. So um, we say that our mission is to become the biggest internet platform outside the US and China. And what we do is we identify and build proven internet business models, and we take them to new underserved or untapped markets. And then we seek to scale them to market leading on online companies. OK, so how many different companies are we talking here? I think there's an official limit of 75 companies across 110 countries, and uh, I think 30,000 people in our network. That's amazing. So can you name for this audience some of the companies that they might be familiar with, or perhaps some of the verticals? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, e-commerce, marketplaces, and fintech are the three pillars to our business model. Um, so recent billion dollar valuations within our companies would be Lasada, which is a general merchandise company in Southeast Asia, um, Home24, an online furniture store in uh, Europe, or Defiti, um, an online fashion company in South America. That's a pretty big range. OK, so let's talk about specific markets. So if I were to grab an average person in Pakistan, say, what device would they have, and what would be on it, and how would you be connected to them? Yeah, so I guess you would find a rather simple Android device, um, maybe a feature phone. Um, what they would, uh, would find is uh, they could order a cab through Easy Taxi. They could um, find real estate through Lamudi. Um, they could find a car through Car Moody. They could um, go on a marketplace like Kemu. Um, they could order from an Amazon business like, business -like model um, like Deraz. There is basically, for every single need that a customer may have in an emerging market, we would try to find a solution to help find it. So you're saying in Pakistan, you have the eBay, the Amazon, the Uber, everything there, yeah. all, of, all in Zillow. your portfolio. Yeah. All right, and so you mentioned a moment ago uh, the number of employees. What, again, is the rocket size, and did you have a, a recent uh, IPO? Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, we, we IPO'd in uh, last October. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, the, yeah, so I said, the largest number is we have 30,000 people across 110 markets. Um, and I think it's around $6.5, $7 billion uh, valuation, okay. uh, euros, sorry. Yeah. OK, so now let's talk about you. Brian said you are CMO. Um, but what exactly do you do as CMO of this huge portfolio of companies? Yeah, there's several tasks. Um, so the first thing is we launch companies all the time. And when we do that, so let's say today we say we're going to launch this business model. Then in 100 days latest, we go live. So within these 100 days, I have to think about how to staff a team that launched this company. It's very different from, say, a normal startup, because we don't have the time to actually uh, wait for scaling, for wait for the breakthrough. So we have to get running from day one. So we have to think about 
how do we most efficiently get customers to this business model? What do we have to do? What kind of profiles do we need? And how can a platform like Rocket help with that? So my team and I, we staff the, we staff the, the company. And then after 100 days, the goal is that they're after launch. The goal is to be payroll independent. So we actually seek to build independent companies that leverage the network effects in our portfolio. So you are running a centralized marketing function, but then standing up marketing functions within each of these companies independently. Is there a relationship there? What's, what is the relationship there? Yeah, so what we try is, is a, take, take, for example, our general merchandise model in Pakistan. So it would not make sense to have data scientists in Pakistan building on the same problems that we're solving in Nigeria or in, in Sao Paulo. So whenever we find a problem that would be worth solving centrally, then we will do so. So for example, we build a software that finds keywords for Google AdWords. That was one of the first big central projects. And um, so basically, you don't want to employ people speaking Burmese, Thai, um, Dutch, German, et cetera, everything in, in Berlin and have these people um, book keywords. So we thought, we know what we're selling, and we know the language, so we can scrape the internet. And uh, so we deployed a software after a few months of development. And for this company, we doubled revenues in search within two weeks. So that was kind of the first big project within our, within our network. And that's the kind of problem we think it makes so much sense to solve that centrally. And it does not make sense at all to solve that in every single company separately. And that's also we see the, the power of the platform. We had to have all different verticals, all different geographies. I think there's no other company that would be active in 110 countries across all these verticals and learn from the data that we have across all the companies worldwide. So basically, you're saying you're a CMO who's a data scientist in some sense. And you have been a data scientist previously, right? So you've already alluded to it a little bit. But how do you leverage the data that you have to make your businesses successful? Aside from perhaps keyword optimization, where does data science fit in? Yeah, I think the whole, the whole concept of how we work is we look at customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value. So basically, it all comes down how much can we spend today on a new customer. And if we're very good at modeling that, then there is actually, there's no, actually not, not a risk involved in the way we acquire the customers. So there is a financing um, part. But in the end, we have to be very, very um, aware of how much will this customer spend over a certain amount of lifetime, let's say six months or a year. And if we're very good at modeling that, then we can simply buy more and more traffic. And we know that we're going to be on a customer basis break even after a certain amount of time. Um, and the difference is, I think, that we do everything to have this measurement um, in place on day one. So we know what kind of data we have to collect for each type of business model. There's people who think about it. What is the data we have to collect? How do we store it? Um, what do we need to process it? Who needs? How has, does that data have to be available for different um, people? How frequent has to, does it have to be available? What are the access methods? Is it a, like a Pandas notebook, or is it, um, let's say, uh, an Excel sheet, et cetera? So we know about all this. We set it up from day one. And uh, then we're able to execute. And this is, I think, the, the big difference. And the people in charge, so for example, me and marketing, are all very data driven. So it's not that I have to lobby with an uh, our organization with uh, like a high-level manager. It's just the way we set up the whole department. It's we're looking first at the data, and then we look at the creative part, or whatever it may be. Makes sense. And so you're taking the learnings then from one company in one vertical, potentially, to learnings in other companies in that vertical, perhaps around the world. Or there's some way in which you're being able to learn from the heterogeneous pieces as a whole. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And also, the, comes like AppNexus. So let's say the access to AppNexus or to, to Google or whoever, um, that's very standardized. So in the end, the data that goes into our partners, that's standardized. So we just have to make sure that every company kind of has an interface to the, to, to the other systems. And that's something that we have solved centrally and that gives us a, um, a competitive edge when launching new business models. Got it. Yeah, so speaking of launching new business models, I suppose. Your founder and CEO, Oliver Samware, has said, and I quote, we are builders of companies. We are not innovators. But what you're doing in marketing does actually seem pretty original. So can you elaborate on that statement? Yes, yeah, sure. So I think innovation? what he wants to say is uh, what we don't face is um, adoption risk. So we do not think about what is something that consumers may want in the future. We invest in business models that have a proven for example, a general merchandise model. We believe that people all around the world will want to use a service like Amazon. So 
we only face the execution risk. Can we deliver on building such a service, for example, in Southeast Asia? So we had to build logistics in Southeast Asia from scratch. Um, that's something you would say that's not innovative because there is already a, an Amazon business model in other markets, but it is in the execution where in, in, uh, there's innovation happening. And the same way for marketing, you cannot hire people in a traditional way and do that across 110 countries. In, a, in particular, in many of the markets, you would not have talent to do that. So we were forced to find a solution, and our solution to that had been through programming, through math, however you want to call it. Data science. Data science. Um, so innovation and creativity in execution rather than in the idea generation at the beginning. Yes. Awesome. So can you tell us what some of your main challenges are then in your role? People, technical, what have you? Yeah, I think we have, so in, of course we have people all around the world. So you have very strong characters and people that do not always understand exactly what you're doing here. So imagine that you're the budget owner um, of a company and um, you have your people and they're researching um, which publishers to work with or um, rules for performance, et cetera. And there's somebody coming and telling you, you're not gonna do that anymore. Um, here's a software and um, from tomorrow on, uh, the software is gonna decide for you. So you have to kind of convince people that you don't have a physical, um, well, a physical meeting with. So they're, they're somewhere in Sao Paulo, they're in Singapore, in Bangkok. So that's, that's very complicated. At the same time, you need the right people on your side. So it's not enough to only have programmers, but also people who know how to communicate what they're doing. And this is like the whole, the whole profiles you have to hire are very complicated. And at the same time, the job of having a group that is highly decentralized um, across all the world and very, very many different time zones and uh, geographies with no great internet access. So that makes the whole, say, product management difficult. On the tech side, of course, there's a lot of data. Um, there are not many solutions out there that make it easy, for example, even if you provide the lock level data, so how do you actually work with it? How do you make sure that um, all the business insights, the data that is modeled, that we understand it in the correct way? I think a lot of the leverage is not only having the great algorithm, but actually having the right features that you optimize for. So for example, we have been a lot more successful than many of the fancy algorithms um, across marketing channels, simply by looking exactly at the data that we have and how can we create features with that data. And creating the right features has been proven for us to be crucial for the marketing success. So not only, for example, having a zero one event for success or not success, but actually taking all the signals that are relevant in, in the customer journey to predict um, marketing success. So there's some complexity there that you have to be able to capture rather than just yeah. simplistic binary traditional methods. Yes, and at the same time, I think um, investors or say oh, CEO, not, if you're working too long on a problem and there is no tangible success, it's kind of complicated to tell them what you're doing. So I think, the state that marketing has gone into is so complex that you need kind of a mathematician to kind of verify whether you're working on the right subjects or not. And that, I, I could say that maybe that is somehow my role right now. Being able to talk to the team and understanding what they're doing and then deciding is it worth to invest more in this direction. Makes sense. I am resisting the temptation to ask you mathematical details right now. Um, okay. Well. Then my final question for you, Brian and others have talked a lot today about marketplace evolution and consolidation. And you are in the business of predicting trends. So can you tell us broadly, what do you think is next? Well, I think we're already in the, in the process of um, having more and more advanced algorithms. And um, you, you've seen some of the, let's say, closed systems that um, like Google and Facebook, the players, they already are able to provide um, better success with the data they have. And of course, I'm a big believer that given the data that you have as an advertiser, you're, you're, much, you're in a much better position to actually um, predict marketing success. So there will be a way of using your own data in more and more, like in a higher percentage of the impressions that are sold. So how can we make sure that um, Mainly, I'd say the, the main part of the traffic is being sold through programmatic. And uh, how can we make sure that all the advertisers are in a position to, to leverage that? And I think it's, it's very far away right now, but the more people are in a position to actually decide and to run the projects and not being um, simply like a lobbyist internally, um, the faster this uh, will progress. 
And uh, <clears throat> so you think that'll yeah. be a trend broadly within the industry? Yeah. You think I you're think it's a broad trend. At the same time, like uh, if you look at customer lifetime value, so the way we, we look at it, it's not what you make immediately with a customer. It's more about what do you make throughout a lifetime, and be it like a six-month horizon or one-year horizon. Mm -hmm. So understanding really well what what are the influencing factors on um, cash flow coming from a customer, mm -hmm. and basically building that conditional expected value. So given the information I have at auction time, what is the expected cash flow coming from that user discounted? Um, and that's, in the end, what I want to bid. The second part is, do I actually bid this value, or do I have a strategy of saying, how do I best accomplish that? That's more on the low level side. But high level, really knowing what can I expect in terms of revenues from this user, and then being able to have a system um, that makes it easy for me to compute this information and uh, use it for decision making. Perfect. So at a bird's eye view, then, you're extracting the value from the data and connecting it to meaningful advertising. Yeah? Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Arthur. It's a pleasure having you here. Thanks.